it's always a joy to see all of you arrive, and, and we, we say that every time. But it's particularly interesting right now um, because I see, I see so many of you whom I have seen over the last seven weeks in all these different places. And it's uh, beautiful to see the uh, collage, the, the fullness of uh, everyone in, in one place. So many, so many wonderful people. <clears throat> So it looks like there may be a few more people arriving. So let's uh, sit together uh, for a bit and and settle and uh, read, reform, re knit together our shape uh, in this online way together. As we sit, please take good care of those tender human longings for embodied presence and connection, which so many of us were blessed to enjoy over the last couple of months. And at the very same time, 
do not believe the illusion of separation. Do not concretize and make into a solid position. A sense of non-connection and separation. And at the very same time, take care of your tender longings for embrace within that larger space. Holding to either something's missed. In just a moment, as I invite the bell to signal the end of our silence, <clears throat> and we'll use our voices for the verse of the robe. Here in those few beautiful poetic lines, a response to our vulnerable humanity at the same time, the realization of our boundlessness. Vast is the robe of liberation a formless field of benefaction. Wearing the universal teaching, I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. 
Vast is the robe of liberation, a formless field of benefaction. Wearing the universal teaching, I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. Vast is the robe of liberation, a formless field of benefaction. Wearing the universal teaching, I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. <clears throat> One of the beautiful things about uh, being in the in-person retreats is chanting together and being able to hear the voices, the, the swell of the sound. And I do want to speak about that a bit, <clears throat> pardon me. But first, I want to offer my really heartfelt gratitude to all the teachers who offer themselves so fully during the times when, when I'm away um, this, this time of inquiry isn't mine, um, although I enjoy it and find it uh, to be a very vital expression of who I am as a teacher, but it belongs to all of us. And um, as each person has come forward and uh, led the time and invited you to reflect on your practice deeply, I'm grateful to them. And also, I feel an immense gratitude to everyone who offered such generous and attentive care to me uh, as I travel from city to city, uh, literally country to country, uh, sangha to sangha. Um, so I'm, I'm very blessed to have been able to, uh, to make such a journey and to be cared for so well, because it's challenging. Uh, as you might imagine, I'm a bit in a state of um, disorientation. In, in some ways, I'm not quite sure who I am or how to think about the things that have happened since the third week in March. Through Dharma transmission and that a vital and, and powerful time uh, with Peg and Vicki Austin and we plunged into that great mystery. And then to spend a, a beautiful week with my mother, grounded in my blood ancestors there, and just having fun, uh, coming to Austin, returning to Austin, returning to Abamada, and seeing so many of you. then traveling to Minneapolis to the Awakening Together Sangha, and uh, then to Madison, then to the Justice. I, I could um, give you a long recitation, and, and you know me, I could also give you a slideshow of <laughs> everything that uh, has gone on. It's, it's really been beautiful and immense, but it leaves me in an unusual state. So I, it's gonna take me time and I'm sure I'll reflect on more of this over the next uh, few weeks. To begin to understand even a, a part of what, uh, what has happened. Um, and not just for me, but how things are turning. But first, just a little bit of maybe a review. <clears throat> Like during the pandemic, as we binge on Netflix and Amazon Prime, and it says on previous uh, episodes, um, when I was in Austin, the emphasis of my my talk, although the emphasis wasn't actually in the speaking so much, 
was embodied, the embodied inconceivable. How through our bodies we meet the inconceivable nature of our lives and how the transmission is the embodiment of the mystery and its transmission and movement through our bodies and through our lives as our lives. In Awakening Together in Minneapolis, the title of the retreat that was chosen by that group is Clarifying the Call to Practice on the Great Matter of Birth and Death. They're a relatively young Sangha, but my goodness, wholehearted and so beautiful. And they wanted to go deep into what calls us. And at the deepest level, the great matter. And how we understand Zazen and the precepts as essentially the whole of Zen practice. In Madison and Open Door, we took the four embraces, which I've mentioned before, of um, Dogen, um, the practices of offering, kind speech, harmonizing conduct and intimacy action, and unfolded and wove those together in this larger embrace. And I spoke to you from there, from Holy Wisdom, um, with the thread through that a bit of teachings being the longing to be held. And this embodied inconceivable and the longing to be held are these two aspects that I'm that I mentioned today in, in sitting. But the vulnerability of our humanness and the longing for something greater. At just this, we went into the four embraces again uh, with an emphasis on loving kindness and compassion and self-compassion. So that's just a little bit of uh, review in a context of what I was Im immersed in, in teachings and, and with many of you who were there. But for those who weren't, it gives you a little bit of a context. In the final retreat of the series, uh, which was in Lancaster in the north of England, uh, we were, <clears throat> we met in a, a building called the, the Story. Uh, it's named after Thomas Story, who was a philanthropist in the 19th century. And he had a vision of promoting art and science and literature and technical instruction to the people of Lancaster and built this uh, immense building, pretty in the shadow of the castle, actually, there. <clears throat> and we met in a grand hall, uh, not just a room, it's a grand hall. Um, and in the back, a life-size um, marble sculpture of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert standing and sitting quietly and steadily with us the entire time. So it was quite a, a beautiful thing. So imagine yourself in this grand hall with a long skylight with beautiful wooden floors, a bit echoey because it's so huge, enough space for 50 people to do walking meditation and to sit together. And this is a building in which many other things happen. Uh, there are offices and people coming and going, but you can hear street noise a little bit now and then. Um, but it's a, it's a wonderful place to sit in. And we had a wonderful retreat. On the Saturday of the retreat, during the longer sits of the morning. <clears throat> you can imagine yourself in this in this room, quieting down as we sit and walk and sit. And <clears throat> as we were sitting that morning, we began to hear a faint sound uh, coming through the walls very very faintly in the beginning but ultimately more distinct at, at least in certain moments and I could feel as much as hear that which was 
uh, was coming. There was a little girl's dance class in the adjacent gallery in the building on Saturday. And you know, I don't hear well, <laughs> so maybe it was heard more clearly by others than by me, but it was this powerful feeling. It was coming through the walls. Just as it does when we sit in the zendo and face the wall. The entire world and all beings come through as we meet the space with our bodies and with our hearts and our minds. And when we offer our bodies to the moment, without any demand that we receive an answer or some clear direction, how do I solve my life, you know, or some final solution or teaching that's going to, that we could cling to and that it would dissolve all our difficulties. If we cling and look in this way, we're going to miss appreciating the mystery of what it means to be alive at all. And in those moments, we, or at least I began to realize that gorgeous voice, full of longing and surrender, flowing over us as we sat very still and silent on our side of the wall. Breath after breath, the music would um, fade away and then it would swell again as I imagined the teachers, you know, carefully helping the little girls, demonstrating to these young students how to use their bodies to respond to the music, supporting them in how to embody you know, what was surrounding them, how to embrace and be embraced by the weaving of the music and the dance, not, not really understanding or even hearing the words. I, I, I couldn't necessarily, and I, I doubt if the little girls paid much attention unless they were Adele fans, you know, to the words. But even so, would they understand what was being said? But they were, more than likely, I was certainly touched by the feeling, by the longing, by the anguish, the hope. And this is what we're always touched by with each other. If we, if we pay attention, and all I could hear was go easy on me. because at the end of the sitting, we were going to chant the Metta Sutta. And the request for kindness, for an embrace. And so I, later I looked up the lyrics. And this, my inquiry today is not about Adele or this song particularly. That was just the setting any more than, you know, when Josh gave us that beautiful talk about seeing that Rembrandt self-portrait. It wasn't about Rembrandt per se, it was about what it did to him. Can you believe what you're seeing? Could we believe what we we're hearing? And the bridge or the chorus that goes on and on where she says, go easy on me. I was still a child. I didn't get the chance to feel the world around me. I had no time to choose what I chose to do. So go easy on me. Isn't that how it is with us? That we, we come to a life and try to live like a, a full life with school and work and marriages and relationships and break up and children and the beautiful things that happen that are miraculous and the horrible things that happen. But without 
maturation, we just make the best choices that we could. And so when you hear that, the, the feeling behind the, the going easy, there's a lot of feeling in that. And I'm sure all of you have reached out at times and oh, if you look at that word easy, it, it's a complicated word because it doesn't mean indulgent, like give me a break. Um, that would be indulgent. But actually, if you look at the definition, it means something slow, careful and calm, which is the invitation in our practice. And also without too much judgment or criticism and, and, and judgment or punishment might be possible, but softly. And I, and I think that really this kind of easy and what I was feeling in that moment, sitting with everyone, is the call for mercy. It was merciful. Please be merciful. Please offer kindness and space where it might be easier to be harsh. And, and this is why I was thinking of as self-compassion. Can we do this to ourselves? You know, she has her own particular story. She's writing these lyrics and about her own marriage and life. But what if this was a, for yourself? a plea for kindness and compassion inside. And if you look further at the lyrics, which once again isn't really my point, but I thought it was curious that in the, the first verse it says, there's no gold in this river that I've been washing my hands in forever. You know, you go to a river to try to mine the gold, and it's, it's where you're looking for it, it's not there. In our everyday life, we try and seek for the solace, the, the, the care, the, the freedom, the joy, the ease is going to be if we just get it all right. And she says, I know there's hope here in these waters, but I can't bring myself to swim when I'm drowning in the silence. So let me in. So it's about a personal thing, but it's, you've got to go deeper than just trying to sort yourself out, just fix your personality. In the second verse, she says that there's no room for things to change when we're both so deeply stuck in our ways. Self-centered dream, caught in the self-centered dream. And she says, you can't deny how hard I've tried. I changed who I was to put everybody else first. And now I give up. And she talks about relinquishment. And then finally, in the last verse, I had good intentions and the highest hopes, but I know right now that probably doesn't even show. And so we ask for mercy. If this were just sentimental or romantic, which of course it is in some ways because it's a song that sells, but sentimentality and romanticism is about drama, not dharma. But if you take this deeper, what I felt in that moment when I was sitting in a dharmic space and just heard that plea for go easy on me, this true request to be let in, an honest turn toward relinquishment of giving up, and a deep intention to practice for the benefit of others. What's your intention? What's your aspiration? These were all there. But without, and the, the difference is, without spaciousness, without the emptiness of, in our practice, which is the foundation of our practice. Compassion is just an everyday limited action of our personality. Without emptiness, without boundlessness, we're going to only experience our personal conditioned selves, all of our parts, attempting to meet the unsolvable realities of life. And that's just called samsara. But this vastness, this mystery, emptiness can't be concretized. It's the inconceivable. We can feel it coming and we can feel our response to it. A connection with the unseen through our bodies, with our bodies, just as we did in that meditation hall that morning. And this is the function of all of our forms. This is what Zen practice invites. 
by asking us to walk in certain ways, to bow in certain ways, not because it's holy or special, because it invites a way to make visible the invisible and touch something beyond what we can understand and sort out. Life can't be solved. It's unsolvable. But it can be lived. And we may, like Joanna Macy said, try to explain and predict and control it away. We want to explain, this is why it's happening this way. But we don't know, actually. We want to predict how it's going to go so we're not surprised. But we're always surprised. We want to be able to control it, but it's completely out of control. But we can't appreciate it. But without spaciousness, this is impossible. So we sit in Zazen. And even then, we look for results and content and solutions rather than a way forward through and with the impossibility. Some of you I know are familiar with um, this new book. And I may have already shown it to you, The Shamanic Bones of Zen. In the foreword, this is written, as humans we are organic, impermanent forms of congealed earth who channel water, animate fire, and circulate air, and we're capable of embodying flowing wellsprings of love. Are you willing to experience love? And once again, this is not romantic or sentimental. We're the earth getting up and walking around, meeting each other and dissolving back again. And in doing so, we become a channel, we become a vessel for, for life to flow through. In some of the retreats, I offered this quotation. I may have had it in inquiry before, but I can't remember. Uh, it's hard for me to remember what I've spoken about in the last month or two in these retreats. But it's about that vessel, and it's about, it's once again, it's a musical analogy. But it's also the essence of uh, the, the precepts in our deep practice. And this is, it came out in a, a conversation between Stephen Colbert and John Baptiste after his uh, Carnegie Hall performance in February of this year, in which he was on stage for an hour and a half with no music and simply improvised in front of a full house in that great hall. And Stephen Colbert, Colbert asked him why. Why would he do this? And Bati said, there's something very transcendent about allowing yourself to be a vessel. There's something very transcendent about allowing yourself to be a vessel. In the moment, for the music that's always in the air. It's always there. It's a current that's there. You can dip into the stream. We do it with our consciousness, with our dreams, with our thoughts, but to do it with music, he was saying it's terrifying, but it's also incredibly transcendent. And then he gives the teaching. It can be a way to give that, that transcendence. It can be a way to give that to the people. So when they leave, they can live without judgment. They can live free and truly exist. As we become a vessel through our practice, through the understanding of emptiness, boundlessness, and a heart that's dear and vulnerable and human, we become a vessel to tap into the mercy that's always there, to the kindness, to the compassion, to self-compassion and compassion for others. And it can be terrifying because we surrender and give up our sense of the world. So the world comes to us. But it's a way for us to offer. This is the Bodhisattva vow, to offer. It's a way to give that to the people, Baptiste said, so they can live 
without judgment. They can live with self-compassion, with kindness, to be that riverbed of mercy. They can live free and truly exist. And so as I sat in silence with 50 people in that great hall in England and heard, go easy on me. It really touched that vein of self-compassion and compassion for all. So what are, what are your, your questions or your edges around this? Not, not about music per se, certainly not about that song per se necessarily. You, you hear it all in the lyrics. She's, you could read the confession chant, all my ancient tangled karma from beginning was greed. Hey, it's all there. I now fully avow. Her avowal is the song. And then where do I take refuge? I come back to myself. I come back to my own nature. I come back to the teachings, come back to what I've separated myself from. It's all there and live for the benefit of all beings, which of course is the, the grace of, of that. So please um, come step forward if you will. Judith has stepped forward. Um, I have so much to share that I don't even know what I want to say, but I feel I must say something. <laughs> That's how I felt this morning. <laughs> well, and in some very concrete way, it began with you, Glenn, <laughs> in Austin. Um, Thank you for coming. <laughs> well, thank you for being here. Um, uh, I am now for about four weeks now, that was about four weeks ago, more open than I have ever been in my entire life. And I'm just overwhelmed with how wonderful it is to be in the world that way. Mm -hmm. To be in the world. Yes, and the mind, and for me, uh, the major uh, event has been, I'm off antidepressants. I am experiencing my life. I have been on antidepressants for over 20 years and I'm not anymore. Well, it's good to see the aliveness in your face. Oh, it is so good. <laughs> so good to feel it. Yeah. So good to feel it. And that's uh, in some ways a side effect. It's just something that because what's really coming through is your life force because yeah. it didn't solve any problems. <laughs> mm. No, that's, and that's that's you're you're demonstrating and uh, showing us the essence of these teachings. Mm -hmm. okay. Look forward to seeing you soon. Yes. And we have Eileen. Hello, Flint. Hello, everybody. Um, I want to thank you for coming to Madison, and I want to thank you for your talk, your talk today. It um, had a very strong emotional effect on me. It made me realize in the last year as head student, I was, I was continually bumping into something kind of blindly, and over time began to understand that it was something of love something of love and when you said the quote today from earthland you know are you willing to experience love the question my thought was experiencing love is a lot like looking in the face of god uh, depending upon what god you are looking at of course um, or like looking into the sun you know, there's all this energy and fire that 
comes and it kind of clears you out so that something can flow through you. Yes. Um, and so that's, uh, I'm so grateful and so moved and feeling so much more spaciousness. Uh, and I want to thank the entire community, the entire community and the, well, the whole world. I mean, all being. And uh, I just want to offer thanks and appreciation. Well, it was it was beautiful to be with you in that ceremony <sighs> and to watch you sit upright because I was sitting right next to you. The staff in your hand, firmly on the floor, and firmly in your hand and facing each person. Because you were demonstrating what you're calling love and also, you know, John O'Donohue once said, in the human face, the infinite becomes personal. As you look into the face of the divine. Oh. And I watched you do that over and over and call forward the goodness in each person. Thank you. Thank you. That was another part of the of this tour, which was lovely, is to be there in person for the first time in a while for Eileen's head student exiting ceremony and also for Lynn Moore in the UK and watch them beautifully meet each person and then have the entry of new students with Don and Bonnie and in Madison and John, John Copeman in the UK to engage that beautiful ceremony where they're asked to take take the role and refuse it because they realize it's impossibility and then say yes anyway, because that's how it is. Hi, Becky. Hi, Plant and everyone. Um, it was interesting to me because there was a little thread that ran through that for me that I wasn't nearly expecting. Uh, uh, so I took in the big part of what you were saying, but I think that the fact that, that your talk came right after Mother's Day mm -hmm. uh, let something surface in me that I had thought I had settled enough. Uh, and yet what happened for me was that I saw that there is, there is something further I want to do in, in terms of my daughters who still seem to feel like I like they they are mad at me for not being a perfect mother and for you know all of those things that happen inside of us or wherever you know and and it's made me sad but I've I've you know worked with it a little bit and then let go of it and there's nothing I can do really to to say yes please come come to this space with me and so on but but your talking, uh, your talk today really helped me see that it is something I want mm -hmm. to do is invite them to be with me with ease, <laughs> you know, right. Right. with that part of something as well. And, and I think it helped me feel like I can, I can find that way to open up the possibility. Yes. Yes, I hope so. It's the kind of a, a going easy for yourself and with them that might <clears throat> might open something that otherwise you, you might not know, know how to be with or um, how to make, um, how do I want to say it, how to make it most evident. Yeah. Because like for so long, I've been able to say, look, um, I did the best I could under the circumstances, you know, and that's, that's all any of us can do. Yeah. And, and there are adults now. And, and so, yeah. you know, we both, we all blumber along just sort of doing as well and sometimes not. But can I, can I show you something very briefly before we end our time? Some of you have seen this because I shared it, but I want to share this image. You see that? Yes. So there's mom and my sister, 
her daughter, and of course, beautiful Aaron there, but you know, as, as a mother, you're left holding. It, it started from you. <clears throat> and it's an awesome responsibility and an immense gift. And I hope the unraveling of, of, of that, uh, I don't mean unraveling as in falling apart, but the unfolding moves in a way that's generous for you and your, your daughters. There you go. Hello, Flint. Hello. Um, thank you so much for bringing every gift and talent and um, the entire path of your practice to this talk. Um, I think the technical term for how my body received it was, wow, just wow. Um, and um, I love when I experience the synchronicity of the cosmos. Mm -hmm repeatedly, you know, just over and over because I'm like, oh, you're trying to get my attention. Thank you so very much. Um, because it, it, it revolves around every facet of the paradigm of your talk, which is grace. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you use the word mercy. I use the word grace. And, and what came up for me as you were talking is the curious, um, I don't know what word to use, but paradigm that exists that we expect and ask people to judge us by our intentions. And very often we judge others by the consequence of their actions and not those intentions. And we ask for grace and mercy for ourselves. And I will only speak for me now because, um, and so often I, I don't exhibit that grace and mercy based on consequences as opposed to right. intentions. So this really helped all, all the times this has shown up to bring one deeper layer to it, one more merciful, grace-filled yeah. layer to my practice with myself and others. So thank you so very much. In studying the four embraces at the end, we would say the summary is what you're saying, but this, the, the beautiful tagline was <laughs> embrace within embrace with an embrace, with an embrace. Mm. Thanks, Nilda. And we have Lynn next. Mm. <laughs> Hi. Former head student. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I was just overwhelmed by seeing everybody today appearing and um, I just wanted to say, you know, that how big my family feels now <laughs> as I look at everybody and, uh, and there was something about love as well. I, I, I remember the Saturday morning when we heard the yes. <laughs> Adele <Yeah>. song. <laughs> the walls were singing to us. <laughs> and, Girls dancing on the other side. Yeah, yeah. And um, there was something about the going easy on yourself. Yeah. And uh, I guess I just wanted to share that one of the things, you know, sort of uh, my koan that was the gazing in the mirror koan, the uh, Zen mirror of Tokiji, um, was uh, I spent a year looking at myself in the mirror for yeah, a yeah. lot longer than I would normally. And, uh, and the thing that hit me the most, I think most profoundly, was, uh, you know, that I noticed all the bits that didn't go easy on me initially, but then, <laughs> but then, but then, what, 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 what met me at the end the most was that if I got out of the way of all of that stuff, was love. 
and I saw my own. The love that comes through me, as well as the love that is everywhere. Yes. yes. You open the channel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And for those who are not there, this is what the channel will look like. <laughs> mm. <laughs> mm. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you for all that you do. Certainly. We have Claire tonight. Hi. Hi. I just needed to thank you. I um got to see you when you're here, and that was so special. And then a few days later, I had rotator cuff surgery. Yes. So uh -huh. Big sling on, and I remember telling Mino and Todd how I was going to do the in-person retreat. Um, even though I was having surgery a couple of days before and I had this big vision of being in community and sitting in the Zendo and <laughs> it didn't work out at all. Like yeah. I was in so much pain and, um, you had to go a little easier. <laughs> well, I guess so. And I got kind of like a, where I understood why wild animals or animals hide underneath the house when they don't feel very good yeah. and uh so i haven't been able to really show up and um because it hurts like i didn't know it was going to hurt this bad and so i'm not sleeping and um but the beautiful thing is that like last night I was up and I was trying to just remember life as it is the only teacher and these lines that you and Peg have taught us and that are a part of all of us and it was so weird because I, I actually forgot these words for a minute and um, so I'm just grateful that I reconnected because um, it all started to feel very contingent like the only way I could practice and believe those words life as it is the only teacher was if I actually felt healthy and strong enough to yep. but um so I've been hiding out like you know under the house and um so coming back today and just getting a chance to go ahead and be sad instead of feeling like I have to hold it together um, has been really helpful. And I, I, I know that those words are true, but it's weird how you can start to doubt them when something like pain, of course, makes you kind of cave in, you know, this, that's the, you reach the limit. I reach the limit of my practice in those moments when the grief is too big, the pain is too hard. Uh, but it's the surrender, it's the the giving up. I give up. Where something else becomes possible, but no one, but no one can tell you what that is, and it is not very encouraging. But it is a way through, and you're you're making your way through because you are you have constancy, which is such a crucial aspect of practice, as Zuki Roshi would say. Well, thank you, and I just am grateful because it's um, easy to lose the thread that you mentioned when you came to Austin and we all held that red thread. And it's, if you're in pain and you're taking narcotics and you're not sleeping, it's really, mm -hmm. it's easy to lose track of that. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, Kathy Rashke, who was a former head student in Madison, she's about three weeks ahead of you on the same surgery. So reach out, reach out to her. Maybe she'll reach out to you. <laughs> okay. I'm going to be fine. I just, um, I'm grateful because I know that those words are true and I know the thread is there, but it's kind of scary how easy it is to, um, feel out of touch with them. Absolutely. That's why we need each other to help remember. 
Yeah. That's what we pass the thread on. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Just have a moment or two, but I don't want to miss Rosemary. Oh, th thank you, Flint. Um, yeah, you you got me in the in the um, your guided talk when we were meditating in terms of the longing. Um, uh, and I kind of related to what Clayton was saying about lo losing faith. Um, mm -hmm. I got a little panicky yesterday about retirement and who was I going to be? What was I going to do? And I did. I don't know. And that's the for me it's very very painful and um i was really angry about being upset um and um it really took me till about i had meditated for half in the morning and i needed to i wanted to meditate some more in the evening it took me till nine o'clock to in the evening to remember suzuki roshi saying that you know these um, weeds are a treasure for us and um yeah so i got to it but you're talking about the longing really opened things up because my focus i think i've always confused attention and love and i've managed to get plenty of it and um it's different and every time i sit with you i kind of get it good yeah, yeah. Like together yeah, and when we were sitting and when we were meditating, I my eyes were at your your chest level and I was like watching your, you know, we were kind of breathing together. So that was kind of an co embodiment help as well. So yeah, yeah. and I know you have a background in dance, so I know there was a ways in which that was also resonating in you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Really good to hear from you and see you. I was so wonderful to uh, actually hug you in Austin. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, let's uh, intone the, uh, the four practice principles to complete our time together. <laughs> Caught in the self-centered dream, only suffering, holding to self-centered thoughts, exactly the dream. Each moment, life as it is, the only teacher, being just this moment, compassion's way. Caught in the self-centered dream, only suffering, holding to self-centered thoughts, exactly the dream. Each moment, life as it is, the only teacher, being just this moment, compassion's way. Caught in the self-centered dream, only suffering, holding to self-centered thoughts, exactly the dream. Each moment, life as it is, the only teacher, being just this moment, compassion's way. Thank you all. Bowing all the way around to everybody. <laughs>Thank you so much, Flint. Thank you so much for being here, especially after two months of, of travel. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, everybody else, for showing up today. And if you'd like to make a contribution off Adana to Apamada for its programs and facilities, then please do go to the website at apamada.org forward slash contribute. And there you'll see an opportunity to offer Dana to teachers such as Flint and Peg and, and other teachers such as Laurie, who's here, here this evening, and Todd and Joel, and also to other events and opportunities that happen at, at Apamada. You can make a one-time contribution or you can sign up for regular, regular contributions. So thank you all so much for being here. And if you'd like to continue to meet and share, then please do, please do just stay right where you are and we'll continue on the virtual porch for a further 30 minutes, although it doesn't feel very virtual these days, does it? It feels very real. Thank you all so much. I'll see you all shortly.